The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Avantios Investments Limited, ABN 20096259979, AFSL 2455331, AIL, and Colonial First Aid Investments Limited, ABN 980024835252, AFSL 232468, CFSIL, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm David Pritchard, Executive Director of RAP at Colonial First State and responsible for our new innovative platform, CFS Edge. As technology progresses at rapid pace, the effective adoption of it has the potential to be a real game changer for practices, and undoubtedly it's going to play an increasingly important role in advice going forward. In this series, we uncover how technology can be used to drive competitive advantage, reimagine your client value proposition, and support continuous improvement. Hi everyone and welcome to today's episode where we're going to be looking at customer experience and the important role that technology plays in helping advisors service more clients and ensure their existing clients are really seeing the value that they provide. Joining me today is David Pritchard, Executive Director of CFS RAP at Colonial First State and Brett Arnold, General Manager of Advice at Viridian Advisory. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Fletcher. David, uh, you've got a long history of enhancing technology in financial services. So what brought you to CFS? Yeah, correct. I've got a tech background, started out as a developer. Um, I joined CFS five years ago. And prior to that, I was the Chief Information Officer for the United Nations in Germany. So I reached out uh, when I was on my way back to Australia to get involved in the sale of the CFS business at the time, um, knowing that um, there was capital in the market. Um and likely to result in a large amount of investment. And I love the transformation challenge. Um, So that was five years ago. Four years ago, we set out building a market-leading platform, not a me-too play. This was really about, you know, thinking deeply about the platform of the future, the advice business of the future, and what a platform needs to do to really help that business to drive success. So, Brett, you you were an advisor for many years, and now you're general manager of advice at Meridian. So what's that journey been like for you? Uh, yeah, I started uh, I started my advice journey um, more than 20 years ago now. It's actually a bit scary when you look at the date. <laughs> uh, so um, I was an advisor for nearly 15 years and uh, I loved it. I really loved it. I, I loved uh, seeing clients um, go through a journey of um, financial stability or um, um, an understanding of their personal situation or their family situation that they never understood or getting a level of protection that they didn't think that um, they had access to. Uh, and I miss it. I, I miss the clients, if I'm honest. Um, but I also love my new role, um, which which I've been doing now for nearly four years, um, in, in making sure that I've, the, the advisors have got that same level of um, passion and commitment to their clients to, to see to see them go through their journey over the next five, 10, 15, 20 plus years. So uh, it's it's a great industry and I think it's quite a privileged position being an advisor because what I found is that clients would tell me things within 10 minutes of knowing them that they hadn't told their spouse or they hadn't even told their doctor or they hadn't told their accountant. And I don't think there's many jobs out there that actually get to a level of depth with a client that quickly and a level of security that quickly. So uh, very passionate about the industry, very passionate about uh, clients um, clients getting great advice. Brilliant. So, And that's what we're talking about today. So if we're talking about you know the important role that technology plays in helping advisors service more clients and ensuring that existing clients can see the value that those advisors provide – Let's touch on, well, what is the current experience for today's advice customers? We know there's amazing technology and best practice out there and coming, always coming. So by and large, Brett, what would you say the average client experiences when seeking financial advice today? Yeah, uh, the the client experience has evolved quite significantly post-COVID. Um, the the uh, interaction method that a client and advisor have has has moved beyond just that regular face to face meeting to regular touch points through the use of um, 
video meetings um, or uh, the use of um, uh, information sharing through client portals or um, or through apps or anything along those lines. So uh, there's still the traditional meet a client, understand the client, f- find the appropriate strategy and provide the advice. It's how you actually get that information how you provide that level of advice and how you follow up to implement that is where where the process has changed. So, um, COVID probably sped up a lot around the use of technology with um, with professionals, and and advice was was part of that. Yeah, interesting. I mean, that's a really good point about how COVID accelerated a lot of that. You know, there were, advisors were dabbling in some of those technologies prior to that, but COVID. I mean, there was no choice. If you wanted to keep doing business, you had to really amp up your technology. And it is interesting. I really like how you focused on the word how. All of this is how you get more clients, how you deliver advice, how you get clients to understand your advice proposition. That's that's really what it boils down to. And that's hopefully what we're going to get some really good insights on today is the, is the how. So, David, what about from your side of the fence, right? Working at CFS, you're working at a very large institution. Uh, how have you seen the client experience evolve over time? Yeah, look, we work right across the broad spectrum of, of segments as well. So not just in the advised space, but um, in direct and my super and so on. So um, we've seen it evolve tremendously. COVID was definitely um, a game changer for, for digital experience. Um, that's for sure. But, you know, keep in mind that, you know, unfortunately, boomers are kind of reached now the natural average age of death. Um, so that generation is kind of leaving the industry at this point. And the younger generation coming through have got a totally different expectation in terms of the digital experience, right? Like even just think about our day-to-day life and our interactions with socials and Amazon and, you know, no matter where you are, just look around. Everyone is on their phone looking at apps, right? Constantly. It's just pervasive now. So, you know, the expectation around the digital experience and what that needs to provide, the bar is really high. And it's not just a good experience in terms of, you know, the, the, the website or the app kind of works. Oh, that's just a basic expectation, right? It needs to be personalized. So, like, don't send me an email. I'm not even going to open it. Email was popular 10 years ago, right? This generation doesn't even look at email. Don't send me a nudge or a notification that's not relevant to me because that's just going to annoy me. It's got to be personalized. It's got to be relevant. It's got to be timely. um, And it's got to be prompting me to take some action, right? If it's not actually prompting me to do something, then it's probably just wasted my time. It's, an, it's a good call out, David, because gone are the days of the big bound leather folder. You sit down with your advisor and you get a 140-page uh, review pack and you get this lovely leather folder that you take home and it sits in your library and then you get it out next year and then you look at your financial situation again. There's no 365-day break. It's it's every day. The information's there every day to David's point. It's it's interesting. There's, there's, there's two things in that for me and the first is the intersection of marketing and technology, right? Like I use the term marketing very loosely, but what a lot of what David was just saying is make it relevant, you know, make it timely, all of the, the calls to action. So you've got these two pieces of advisors, you know, needing to sort of really engage with that marketing piece, but also have the tools, have the technology, have the how to reach the clients. And then I guess what came out of it for me just then was, how do advisors or how can advisors manage when they've got potentially clients across all generations? A lot of our client base is still this this boomer generation, but we're getting these ones coming through. So does the advisor need a type of technology that appeals to all of those markets and needs to segment that their their technology based on that? David, what what do you see around mm. different generational type of advice delivery? Yeah, look, it's true. We are in a transition phase at the moment. Um, so I do think the technology needs to be able to support that experience that I described. But for those clients that, that you're talking about, um, you know, firstly, you need to segment and understand, you know, how you want to interact with your different segments of clients. But for those clients that might be older um, or for clients that might have a disability or some other um reason for them not interacting regularly with digital apps and so on you need to be able to drop out of that digital experience 
Um, you need to be able to provide that more traditional, you know, face-to-face high contact experience. Um, but you need to be able to drop back into a digital experience again seamlessly to get the efficiency downstream because it's not just about the experience, right? It's about an efficient advice business that delivers a great experience and, and the technology helps power that, right? So if you're dropping out of digital, you just need to get back into that as quickly as possible to get the efficiency downstream. I love that. The, the, an advice, the best advice practices you know, are, are an efficient advice business that provide a great client experience. I think that that is an excellent takeaway from that. But Brett, you know, you are on the advisor side, right? You know, you're, you're, you're head of advice, right? So what, what do you see with your advisors that have that multi-generational client base? Oh, look, I agree with David's comments. You, you, you've got to be able to be um, nimble enough to meet the client's needs, but also have a system in place to ensure that uh, the, the business runs at a level of efficiency, profitability, um, effectiveness, whatever you want to call it, um, to ensure that um, you've got longevity within your business. Uh, we, use a, we use a terminology, one size fits one. Right, so um, it, it, it's really we, we've seen we've seen um, other businesses that we've worked with go to a hundred percent digital model and clients opt out. So uh, there is a risk that if you go too far down the the technology integration um, path, that that you will lose clients. Now that could be your strategy. By the way, you might actually choose to deal with only technology enabled clients, um, albeit. My 88-year-old grandfather's got a smartphone. So don't put age as – don't be ageist around technology use here, which is which is a common uh, a common misconception that's in the industry, in any industry, that uh, boomers don't use smartphones, boomers don't have emails, boomers can't use technology. They certainly can. It's just about they probably need a little bit more coaching. So, um, yeah, it's one size fits one is the answer, Sasha. Yeah, great. Love that. Love that. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about where – advice technology sort of currently sits and and what clients are experiencing and what different client segmentations look like. So both of you uh, have been overseas and been over there researching, um, you know, input design technology that's come into advice. So David, what did you learn about technology and client experience when you were designing CFS Edge that we can expect to influence our market here? Yeah, we look deeply at um, Europe and the US in particular um, when we were designing Edge to see what we could learn. And they're both very different markets, um, but a lot of takeaways for us. So UK has very strict information security and privacy laws, and they came into effect very early. um, And that drove really um, fast uptake and evolution of client portal technology. Um, So, you know, what that allows is... um, the advice business to communicate securely with clients. Um, so there's no document exchange by email and, and so on, um, which is not allowed in that jurisdiction. So what that meant is that digital engagement is kind of the norm in the UK. And those businesses, are, as a result, they've evolved to be CRM centric, um, which is a different architecture for, for those advice businesses. So the technology architecture in the UK is kind of like a hub and spoke model. It's got the CRM at the center and different pieces of technology that are integrated with the CRM sitting around the outside of that. Um, And the platforms are one of those, Um, but all of the bits of tech have to integrate to and from the CRM seamlessly to really work in that market. Um, Also in the UK, whole of practice advice tools have evolved uh, a lot faster than they have in Australia. Um, We've been really slow with the innovation of, um, whole practice advice tools here. Um, and that um, has driven a lot of maturity in that market as well uh, in terms of the, the experience, but also the efficiency of the businesses. The US is very different, really large market, so fragmented, um, but there's just so much capital in that market that drives innovation. It's incredible. Um, also, the, the US was quite early in introducing some in- data integration standards. So with tech in the US, if you don't support integration out of the box using these standards you're just not even in the game it's a ticket to play so what that's meant is that tech companies have been able to innovate really quickly Uh, a lot of the technology is a little bit more niche but it all kind of plugs and plays Um, so that's driven a very different client experience as well 
um, different to this market, but there's a lot that we can take away from both. Yeah, that's um, that's fascinating, and we we all sort of inherently know that the US and the UK, or you know, Asia, all these markets are so different in the way they deliver their advice, and also the the clients, the customers that they're working with, have different expectations, different products, and all that. Really, really interesting. So, Brett, you also went overseas to explore some of the tech in play and markets over there. So, what did you see, and what did you learn? Oh, I didn't. I couldn't bring in anything tangible back yet. Um, we visited FNZ um, when we were in the UK, and it was just similar to what David said uh, a minute ago. The, the sheer size of the business and their reach into the US and European markets gives them the ability to put, um, have innovation at a rate that we don't see. And I probably came back more frustrated than I did with ideas because you see the open sharing of data and you think, imagine if we had that and how effective we could be with our clients in Australia when we've got um, when we've got a market that isn't as open as as those um, jurisdictions. I, I think what we found also is that the client and licensee, licensee offer into those markets was slightly different to Australia using that technology. And I love that that terminology, David, around at Hub and Spoke, right? That, that's exactly what what we felt. We saw some technology that that built for their um, ultra high net worth uh, client base in the in the US that I would love to get into Viridian, which. Uh, was a risk control that swept across it swept across um, client bases to have a look at where is their air share exposure, where is their um, uh, where is their offshore onshore, where where is the underlying assets within that? It does it align to our APL? Does it align to our risk profiles? Where they're at, which would be a great risk tool from a licensee, and then at an individual high net worth client piece, uh, again pulling um, single balance sheets. So clients using multiple uh, multiple investment streams and then just getting that into one source. There are a couple of dreams that would would really make <laughs> would really make our business um, um, go to another level. Yeah, so interesting. So you know, if we if we talk about it very broadly, we've got the UK with these strict information and privacy laws that have given rise to things like client portals. Um, now we're starting to see that happen here. Now. Apart from the matter of the sheer scale of those markets, right? Australia is a small player in the financial advice market. Are, are we? Is Australia headed in that direction? Um, what What are our sort of privacy and information laws? What's stopping us, apart from size and scale, becoming those markets? Or is there nothing stopping us? We're just a little bit behind. To your point, Brett. With the US, you put an extra zero on the end of every number. Uh, if you put a zero on the end of every number, uh, the capital injection, the amount of te- the size of the team, the the quality of the quality of the information that they get is just ten times what we get. So so that innovation piece is faster. So I, I'd say we're a little bit behind on that. There's definitely an aptitude to to want to change. Agree. I think we are behind. I, I'd put it down to a few factors. Um, one, yep, we're a very small market. Um, two, there's only fifteen thousand registered advisors in this country right and historically i mean this is changing which is really great uh you know i think there's some reconsolidation happening and we're seeing um you know increase in profitability and multiples across the industry for advice businesses but traditionally they've been opex poor and resistant to spend money on technology um right combined with the fact that we've got incumbents in this country that have been very slow on the uptake you know, if you've got an incumbent that's got a large market share, they're not really incentivized to innovate rapidly. Um, so it just hasn't. We haven't had the competitive dynamic here that we've that we've got overseas. Um, so look, I, I think what it's going to take to unlock that is global players coming to this market, global players that have got real scale that are investing significant amounts of money in R and D um, to come to this market and 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 localize and really start to fuel that innovation. So if you think about, you know, AI, for example, it's just going to be so transformational to our whole industry, right? But to make use of it is going to require big data sets to train it. It's going to require quite a lot of investment locally here to kind of take it up. Um, can't see that being done by a local player. It's, we're going to need help from, from, from those markets to really move forward. No, oh, Grace. Interesting. So we've had that sort of large scale lens of looking at the global experience, looking at, you know, the technology in the global advice market. If we sort of bring that right back to what advisors are experiencing here in Australia now, what technologies are available to advisors right now that can help them scale their business, deliver advice efficiently, 
reach clients, personalize all of that sort of at scale. So, Brett, what what are you what are you saying? Oh, there's lots. Is the answer. There's lots of uh, there's lots of startups or there's lots of players that are starting to to find their feet. Um, whether that is through, as you touched on before, a client portal, uh, which is where clients can update data or put um, put information about themselves in. Uh, whether that is um, some kind of consolidator, which tries to bring together multiple platforms to to provide you know, information to um, to the client and the advisor. What we've done with Inverting is we've decided to build versus buy. So um, we built an app. So we just launched our first app, trying to get to that new market uh, or current market uh, called Vip. Uh, and, and and what we want that to be is the way that we communicate with our clients. That that emails go, that uh, a client gets a notification when their SOA is ready, or when uh, or the advisor gets a notification when the advisor is playing, when the client's playing in the app. Saying, "Oh, I might update my data," or "Hang on, you've bought a new house," or uh, "Let's not wait for the review to in, um, engage." What what we'd love to get that to is that pure client vault, where that where and and no, we don't really see client vaults um, prominently across Australia at the moment, where everything a client's got is in a secure um, location online in the cloud, arguably. I am seeing the two patterns play out in advice businesses today So that, that I described in the UK and the US. So I am seeing larger businesses that are becoming more CRM-centric here that are investing heavily in their Salesforce or Dynamics CRM and using that as kind of the source of truth, but also building out the portal off that and, and really trying to kind of manage and, and provide a consistent experience through that um, type of architecture. And then there's other businesses that are kind of more fragmented that might spin up a particular client portal for a particular purpose, um, but then use the platform as well for, for their clients and, and the platform's playing part of the role there in the experience as well. Um, and then different, um, you know, e-signature apps and different things. So there's kind of gets a bit more fragmented, which is probably a bit more like you see in the US. Mm, interesting. So David, I mean, again, coming at it from that large scale organization angle, what what role can platforms play in helping advisors drive innovation in in that customer experience? Firstly, platforms in this country, there's there's not that many, and they've got pretty big scale. Um, they've got access to capital, so we can absolutely help to drive forward innovation in this technology space. Um, we don't have the same kind of OPEX constraints either as, sm- as smaller businesses do. So so we can bring global partnerships and global technology, I think, to bear here locally. Um, and if we can bring global partners across, I think then we can amplify that innovation kind of 50 times, right? Like at a zero, um, like Brett said earlier, um, which will really help. Um, secondly, I think platforms, we need to take an open architecture stance as a community, Um and this is what's held back the industry massively in this country. So, you know, with Edge, we have fundamentally designed this platform to be open architecture. Anything you can do on the platform, you can do through an API um, and real-time two-way data exchange with any external application. And we want to support the whole um, range of applications, right? So open opening up architecture and sharing data is, is key to kind of unlocking it as well. And then we can also lean in and help advice businesses which we're really trying to do for the for the strategic partners that we have. We've got a lot of resources. We've got deep experience with technology and transformation, change management, marketing, and so on. So we can bring all of those capabilities as well to help advise businesses um, with some of the challenges that they've got more holistically when, they, when they're thinking about their client experience and their technology as well. I, I think if you go if you go back to the old advice firm from 20 years ago, they had one CRM, one, one that was their tech stack, one one one, um, one engagement model, uh, and everything was done in there. And then they generally had one platform, and every client went to that. If, if you look at what we term the modern advisor, you could arguably say the modern platform that is multiple multiple um, investment options or, or uh, multiple parts of advice, multiple investment um, options, and, and best of breed plugging in. To, to your um to your systems or your business to ensure that um you've got multiple providers coming in. So whilst there's a level of fragmentation that comes with that, ultimately you you're getting the best of every piece versus just the one size fits all. So that that that's probably the biggest change I see is that 
client, the, the husband and wife, one hus- the husband might go into one um, platform provider, the wife might go into another, just purely because of their needs at that time. Whereas 20 years ago, that was, that was laughable if, if an advisor was doing that. So for our listeners, we do our, we're do we doing a whole episode. Episode four is all about tech stacks. So mark, um, that, mark that point and we're going to, we got a whole episode on that. So Brent's just setting the scene for us. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So let's, let's talk about, you know, this data security piece, right? We're talking about putting data in the cloud. We're talking about client portals. We're talking about making everything digital. And I mean, this is not new to advisors. It's not going to stop either. You know, every, you're seeing all these data breaches and hacks and all of that. It's a, it's, a, it's a fair concern with quite sensitive data. So, you know, what from the advice delivery point of view, Brett, can advisors do to ensure their cybersecurity is up to speed if they're moving to a much more holistic digital platform? Oh, uh, they need to look at it first. <laughs> that, that, that sounds so obvious. It sounds so obvious, but um, uh, I, I speak to other licensees and some of the smaller licensees who don't don't even have a third party involved, right? But they've just said, oh, we can handle it ourselves. So for, the, so for, for smaller practices, I'll be getting that I, ISMS or um, information security management system that you've got, if you've got one, out, blowing the dust off it and have a look here. When was the last time you looked at it? Because... Technology has changed a fair bit over the last two, three, five, ten years. So um, if you're large enough um, and we're fortunate enough to be large enough to, to – we we follow ISO 27001, which is a global standard that, that we use to align to our information security management system. Now, what we do with that is then – uh, we use that to give us a guidance and build all our systems around it. And it annoys the advisors and clients – because it's a standard that's higher than maybe some of the other um, firms that they deal with because we ask them for more information, but it gives us comfort that they're secure. We also then have an internal um, information security manager and we've got a third party which does our security operations. Um, So again, if you're big enough, get to that level. If you're not, at least look at that third party. At least look at that third party to to give you that uh, coverage because people who want information don't do it between nine till five when you're at work. They want it when they want it. And um, scarily, scarily, we went through a uh, a mock, we went through a mock case on what would happen. So we called our exec team in a couple of months ago and uh, they actually put up a report that said, um, this has happened to Viridian and it was the exact same report as Latitude. They just changed the Latitude numbers to ours. And said, "This is what it is, right?" And it's in. It will kill your business. It will instantly stop your business. So, uh, whilst it might be a cost to uh, the firm, whilst it might be a cost to client time, minimal cost to client time, might be a cost to advisor time, minimal again. The cost of not having it is significant. So, it's uh, critically important. Is the answer there? Ultimately, it's, it comes back to that saying: it's it's just a cost of doing business. Now, it's just a cost of doing business. It, it has it has to form part of your tech stack of your business systems, all of that sort of stuff. David, what about from from your end working at that larger institution? What do you see in terms of cybersecurity, data security for advisors and, and the advice network? Yeah, look, Brett spoke um, nicely about, you know, larger firms and, and how they kind of d- deal with it. Um, we work with a lot of smaller independent firms. Um, so I'll maybe just focus there a little bit. Um, Obviously, it's just so important, right? It is the one thing that can kind of blow your business up overnight. Um, so you really got to think about, firstly, think about the perimeter of your technology network. Um, once upon a time, it was easy. It was just like a firewall or whatever. But today, um, you've got this edge of your network that is increasingly kind of expanding into different cloud providers and different tools and technologies and things, right? Very fragmented edge. So you've got to think about that perimeter and managing that. Second, the most important thing is train your people. By far, the majority of cyber incidents that happen are a result of human error. Um, someone clicks on the wrong phishing email or um, you know, does something inadvertently, um, logs into the wrong website or what have you, and all of a sudden they've got a password and a username and, and so on. So that training of your people is just really critically important. Don't do it yourself. Um, so if you're self-licensed, find a partner. Um, if you can't access the services through your licensee, um, get that expert help. It's it's critical. 
with the tech that you select, do your due diligence properly. Demand, as Brett said, either ISO certification or um, SOC 2 is the other kind of world standard cyber certification. Demand one of those two from your tech providers. Um, you've got to have that in place. And then when you're sharing data between those different pieces of technology, that's the thing that you really have to think hard about, right? Like if you're using a client portal tool that's on this cloud over here and you're using uh, a practice management or planning tool that's on a cloud over there, when you're sharing client data, it's literally traveling across the internet between those two clouds, right? Um, so it's got to be super secure. And and the, and the standards and the tech here kind of change constantly and, and keep evolving, right? So get the help of an independent tech expert when you're doing that integration work to make sure that everything's like buttoned down and, and fully secure. That, that piece around educating staff, um, it, uh, as you started talking, I wrote myself a note to say that. So great call. Uh, the, the important part is not once, right? So, so we use an external for that. And it costs nothing. It costs like 20 bucks a year per staff member or something like that. And they send a three-minute video out every month. And, and they're a bit they're a bit like childish. But it's just it's just kind of brings it to the front of mind every month versus you've done your one year training on um a don't click on a phishing link or uh, make sure you've got a solid password. That's in one year out the other if you do it um, once a year. So regularity of uh, of bringing it to the floor is probably the, the add on to that, David. And, you know, I want I want to actually come back to that because you know you mentioned phishing, you know, clicking on the wrong links. Now we're moving into that scam type situation, but I do want to touch on this because Brett mentioned just before we started recording, Brett ran a story by me, and I think it's actually really instructive to explore. So. Brett, tell us about, you know, your experience with this. So much information out there. How do you how do you and your clients pick and know what's right? How do you pick the right one? Yeah. I was more thinking future clients actually when I was uh, thinking about it, in that the internet has it's the, the amount of information on the internet has just gone bananas, right? And, and uh what what my reference point to this is that uh, I I love travel. My family, my wife, my kids and I love travel. And uh, we went to Europe this year for the first time since COVID, and uh, I'm reasonably organised. So I like to book it all myself and run my own spreadsheets and do, do it all. It's, it's quite a um, it's quite a structured holiday. Let's just say that. <laughs> um, uh, but what I found this time, particularly in Rome, particularly in Rome, is that to actually find what was the real tour guide of the Colosseum versus what was a fake, what was a real review versus what was a fake, took days and days. And if I go back five years ago, six years ago, there was maybe 10 companies and you could really get to the bottom. There was like 80 pages that I had to work through to kind of dig it out. And eventually I almost got to a point where I, I, I still shot relatively in the dark because the layers of the layers of um, false information or incorrect information, were, were, it's just the next click away and then the next click away. So... Um, whilst technology can play a part for existing clients and existing um, firms that we've been talking about, technology can play a negative part to a degree for, for new clients because their experience might be negative because they click on a, a, a poor link trying to find your website or uh, a website. Um or it could be a good experience because they click on things like Money Smart or MyGov and they understand some information before they come and see you. So, uh I, I guess the story is that that, that in, information built by technology in the cloud may not always be right, and your client doesn't know when it's right or wrong, particularly if it's got your branding on it. So yeah, be conscious of that. David, what's what's sort of one big move, one big thing that that you would encourage and advise business owners to do to improve client te- uh, experience using technology? Right? Yeah. Look, I mentioned earlier. Don't do it yourself. Um, and this is for the, the smaller firms again. Um, so Brett might have a slightly different take on this, but um, I think you need to take a step back and really think hard about the experience that you want to deliver. Um, it's not just going to evolve ad hoc into a great experience. You need to really design a great experience. So my one big move would be, look, you know, take a step back, engage a third party, think about who are your clients, what are their expectations, you know, What's the value prop of the business and what kind of experience do we want to deliver to those different segments? 
map it out, understand what technology is out there that can support it. And again, you're going to need some expertise to do that because there's heaps of tech out there that could do different bits of this, this puzzle. But you've got to map it out and then map out a roadmap and execute it properly. Um, advice businesses are, are fine. They're great at you know setting up decision-making and governance around investments, for example, but not so much with tech. Um, it just kind of seems to be a bit more ad hoc. So my one thing would be, you know, take it seriously. It's a core part of your business. Engage an expert, take a step back, design it properly, execute a roadmap, govern it like you do your investments. Brilliant. Yeah, that's that's amazing. So, you know, if we've got an advisor who's, you know, decided, right, we're going to go on that journey, let's step back, design the advice experience. Brett, how can advisors budget for, for all these types of technology in their business? Yeah, I think you've got to start at well, what are you looking to achieve with technology? Because you could easily get in a hole of of um, signing up to five different providers that are on a user experience per month, and all of a sudden you've you've kind of got Netflix, Stan, Disney, Foxtel, and all of a sudden you're spending a whole heap of money on stuff you're not using, right? <laughs> so, so you've got to work out what you want to achieve. Now, again, depending upon your size. You've got to then say, do you want to build or buy? Now, but that, that's a conversation we generally have. Should we build this or should we buy this? Um, um, but if you are buying, uh, then you need to go back to, okay, well, what do I get for that purchase? So am I looking to expand my client base and how does technology expand it? Am I looking to find efficiencies in a back office perspective? Okay, well, what time saving will this technology give my support staff? Uh, will this improve my client advocacy? Do my clients actually want to engage in a different way? Okay, that that may have um, different benefits that are, are, are less tangible on a on a on a balance sheet. Do I want to save advisor time? Do I want to save my own time? Okay, how will I do it? And so, uh, you've got to start with those questions before you even engage that third party, because otherwise you'll engage the wrong party, and you'll get a solution. And that solution will improve your business because it's a new part to your business, but it may not be actually what you wanted. Well, one other piece that uh, it's really important to think about is what stage of your working career are you in and what is your workforce under that? Because if you're a single or partnership operator and you're older than the average advisor age, the average advisor is 54 in Australia. So we, we do have a we do have an aging workforce to, to David's point before around the 15,000 advisors. Um, do, do you want to go through this change? Do, do, do you want to actually, because you've got to commit to it. Now, if you don't want to go through that change, should you find a partner who's already done it and and partner up with them and talk about um, how can we use your tech stack or how can we use what you've done or how do we merge our businesses together to get to this point without uh, without actually going through all of that yourself? So um, they're, they're the questions I'll be asking for before you budget and then actually budget actually say this is going to cost us five, ten, twenty thousand dollars a year, but the payoff is X at this point. Put yeah, put effort into it, as David said before. Yeah, there's some great tips on there as to how, you know, before you even integrate any new technology into your into your business. Again, take a step back. Both both of you so aligned on that idea that you've got to take that step back and design the experience first because just a slapdash approach to any of this is not going to yield the results that that you want. It's going to yield some results, but not sustainably and not the results that you want. So I want to sort of take a different tack and look at that sort of bigger picture again. So this CFS Empowered Australian report in 2023 found that one in three Australians who never received advice can't articulate a single benefit they would get from receiving advice. So I'll start with you, David. How can the value of advice be demonstrated? To those who've never received it? Great question. And look, <laughs> that research is, I found that really disappointing because to me that says that as an industry, we've got a lot of work to do to educate people. So, you know, we've done a lot of research on the value of advice and it's very, very clear that anybody that receives professional advice will be better off, fundamental. So yeah, if people just don't appreciate that, we're missing something. We're missing a trick here as an industry, right? We just haven't educated people. So I think, you know, CFS has a role to play here and we try really hard um, in terms of just getting the information out there through media, um, through, you know, podcasts like this or any other medium that we can um, to try to educate people around the value of financial advice. Um, that's one thing. Uh, look, I think the other thing is um, 
our advice industry is very supply constrained at the moment. So we've got this big gap in this country of people that, that even if they wanted advice, they can't access it. Um, they can't afford it or there's just, um, you know, not enough advisors to go around. Um, so as an industry, we, we need to lean into that challenge as well, right? So, you know, we're advocating for regulatory change to assist with that. Um, that will help to unlock supply a little bit. Um, but increasingly, I think we need to think about, you know, ways that we can provide episodic advice when people need it, um, low touch advice as well um, for clients with less sophisticated needs that might not need a full service advice offering, but but just something that's more tailored to their life stage or, or their needs. And look, our industry is just not set up for that and our regs aren't set up for that at the moment. So I'm kind of not surprised that there's, you know, an education gap and an advice gap, gap but it's very disappointing, isn't it, um, as practitioners in this industry that this is where we are. Yeah, Brett, and I mean, you're sitting on the advisor, you know, on, on that advice delivery side of it. What about for yourself? How can advice be demonstrated to those who never received it? Uh, look, David took some of the words out of my mouth there. I'll come back to what the way advice has been adverti- advertised um, to non-advice clients and and the education piece in a minute. But re- the regulations, the, the way they sit at the moment, I know QIR is close, but it's been close for three years. The expectation on an advisor to go so deep with a client and not be able to just solve a single need problem, um, it, it just pushes people away from the industry. It, it really does. And that's not only um, clients, but advisors. It's pushed advisors right. And so that 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 single need of advice, I've got $20,000, should I put $1,000 into super to try and get a co-contribution? No one gets that. Not one person in the industry, uh, sorry, in the, in the country will get that advice. Or if they do get it, they're getting it from their neighbour. Uh, so we need to get to a point where um, technology is used to speed up the advice journey so that an advisor can actually spend more time with the client and have the rest of the work done behind them, which is a which is a big piece of work that we're looking at the moment is how do we go into a low, what is perceived as a low value client market when it's not. It's just a high, um, a high amount of client turnover market. Instead of seeing 100 clients a year once, you see 500 clients a year once, but those 500 clients you only see once every three years or once every year. So um, from a revenue perspective to, to to business, it could actually equal the same amount, but but you've got to integrate technology to do that because you can't have human, 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 human because that's where the cost of advice currently sits. And, and um, depending upon which report you look at, it's somewhere between two and a half and four thousand dollars per advice document. So uh, it's pretty simple math. If someone's paid me five hundred dollars and it's cost me four thousand dollars, I'm not here next year. So you need to integrate technology to do that. If I then go back to, oh, I also it's it's actually devastating to hear that data that people can't articulate one benefit, not one of seeing advisor that disappointing. I, man, I was heartbroken <laughs> like from, from that because. Oh, it's, they're just one step away. They're one phone call away from actually um, understanding how much value can be added. Whether they're willing to pay for it or not is a different kind of conversation, which is that it that piece before. But I'm not surprised either. If I go back to how has the financial advice industry been portrayed to the Australian um, um, landscape, it's been relatively negative. The, the Royal Commission was... In the news, it was in the mainstream media on how bad our advisors look at uh, look at this licensee head collapsing on stage. Look at the way that um, banks are avoiding answering the questions. A- and people heard that and saw that. And I- I'm not, I'm definitely not um, saying that any of the actions that those advisors took were positive. That, that there were some horrific experiences in there, and those clients, I, I felt very sorry for them. But if you've never experienced advice and you watch mainstream media and that's your only um, information from there, or you know someone who says, yeah, I saw an advisor back in 2007 and I didn't get a lot of advice, I can understand that they say I'm not going to see any value from that. So I think we need to educate uh, not just those those clients who have never received advice, those clients that have received advice to be advocates for the industry. Because whilst there is only 15,000 advisors there are multiple hundreds of thousands of clients that have received advice from their advisor, which has been good advice. That has put them in a better position. 
if they tell two or three of their friends, we start a different movement. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. It's, it's absolutely shocking that, that, that stat coming out of that, that report. But there is so much opportunity. And this is, this is what we keep coming back to in this series is there is so much opportunity and advice right now. And there are tools out there to help advisors deliver that advice effectively at scale to see more clients, to help more people. Right, ultimately to help more people, um, because you know we know there's an education, a financial literacy issue here. There is so much opportunity for advisors to really make their mark. Uh, I, I personally think now more than ever, I, I really do because of the because of the technology available to us. Um, I think I actually it's a great time. Uh, thanks, David and Brett. Thank you so much for taking the time today to to, to give listeners a lot to think about. Uh, so everyone, be sure to tune into our second episode of the series, which will be hosted by Jackie Clark, Director of Education, Engagement and Events at CFS on building a high performance advice practice. David Brett, thank you very much. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks, David. Thanks, Sasha. Cheers.